Okay, we are recording. So let me hand things over to group 427D. Um, hello and welcome to the final presentation of Quatio Shaker Table Design Unicus Exitar. We are excited to display the capabilities of our unique solution to biological solution shaking technology. First, I would like to introduce the members of Quatio in alphabetical order. Hunter Bittner, Jessica Blazik, Daniel Carrada, David Hargrave, Utah Johnson, Darren Keane, and Cameron Mahorn. This presentation will be a comprehensive reflection on the full realization of Unicus Exitar. We will begin by discussing the hedgehog concept, the primary philosophy of which our design came into fruition through. Continuing on to the product overview and cost breakdown, a selection of engineering analyses and a cost analysis will be, will be presented to prove mechanical efficacy and the fiscal advantages of Unicus Exitar. Finally, the presentation will be wrapped up by a conclusive phase where, we'll, where we will begin to open or where we will be open to any questions that viewers may, may have over our design or the contents of the presentation. Prior to the design phase of Unicus Exitar, Quatio was established upon a number of foundations that would steer the future realization of the shaker table. Quatio came together at the advent of, of the design to put forth a unifying guiding principle in designing a product that was as unique as it was functional for shaking biological solutions. Innovation was leveraged in every design stage to create a product that uniquely outperforms competition at a reduced cost in comparison to contemporary products. As we have already discussed, Unicus Exitar pr prioritizes low price to be a function of novel innovation. Coming at approximately a quarter of the price of contemporary shaker tables on the market, the design hosts a particular niche in the market through its highly modular and, high and innovative design. While being capable of all desired usage from a shaker table, including three individual and adjustable motion types, usage and repair of the design requires little technical proficiency, thus making a great product for those with little engineering knowledge. The Quatio shaker table has several key design specifications. The total size of the design was thought to be compact with overall dimensions of 12.8 by 12.8 by 3.85 inches. The size of the system lots an abundance of room for other subsystems to easily fit in the larger bioreactive enclosure. Each component in the system is also designed to operate with the same functionality between a temperature range of four degrees Celsius to 70 degrees Celsius. The entire system is easily assembled as the majority of the fasteners were chosen as M3 by 0.5. This screw size was designed as the standard size of the project used in almost all fastening locations in our product when possible, making it easy to keep replacements on hand. The wide use of the hexagonal insert screws allows for individuals who are unfamiliar with tools to quickly assemble the entirety of the system with an Allen key set and everyday wrench. Lastly, the table was configured to move in three different patterns. The linear pattern was able to achieve 300 cycles per minute for long durations and adjustable orbit sizes of 1 to 25 millimeters. The orbital pattern achieved 120 rotations per minute for long durations and only one pattern size of 20 millimeter radius. The double orbital pattern achieved 100 cycles per minute for long durations and only one pattern size of 20 millimeters along the major axis. At the beginning of the semester, there were, over, there were over 40 designs to evaluate before deciding one to pursue. Through these evaluations our team took, we concluded the most previous, that most previous designs used linear rails or a Scotch yoke system. Some could do minor adjustability for the required patterns, and others were completely non-adjustable. We decided to create something that was able to have three patterns while incorporating continuous adjustability. During the design selection process, we asked our professors to give insight on what did and did not work with previous final designs. We were informed that nearly all previous designs use linear rails and that a novel solution that did not include them would be beneficial to the progress of the design problem. This is due to the expense and complexity that these linear rails add to the system overall. The initial concept, as seen on the left, involves four flywheels, each with a pen and table with four slots that the pins are inserted inside. This design allows us to have independent control of the X and Y axes in theory. 
However, the resolution is limited by the minimum motor step and radius of pin placement on the flywheel. After two design reviews, the initial concept was crafted into the prototype design as seen in the middle. After building and testing this prototype, the final post prototype design was finalized. The two main differences between the two designs are that slots were inserted and added, and that the slots on the table were widened. The reasons for these modifications will be outlined in a later slide. The Quadio Shaker table has some design fundamentals that are crucial to the overall operation of the system. First, the motion of the table is controlled by two NEMA 17 stepper motors, which each, ro which each rotate a swing arm. The swing arms each house a pin that mechanically engages with the table to translate motion from the motors to the table. The slots in each edge of the table permit independent control of the X and Y axes. Utilizing these slots, the, motor manip the motors were manipulated to move either in unison or in different configurations to create the appropriate pattern. The table also has the capability of achieving the ultimate goal of proper culture aeration and prevention of microbe sedimentation by accommodating either two standard size well plates or one tube rack. Minicus Exitare features several design highlights. The first highlight is a single plane actuation that does not use expensive linear rails. Since we are not lose, using linear rails, we don't need a stack system to control our table. Looking at the picture on the left, you will see the table support assembly, which is a sheet metal table support combined with an aluminum plate that holds a roller bearing and the appropriate fasteners. Then a D shaft is combined with the swing arm and pin to be able to support the table. Looking at the middle picture, we see an exploded view of each major subassembly, which includes the motor supports, table supports, table assembly, and base plate. The picture on the right displays the motor assembly. This assembly is manufactured as closely to the table support as possible for each of manufacturing, excuse me, for ease of manufacturing and part replacement since each assembly uses the same table support bracket and fasteners. With this assembly, we have stacked a washer needle bearing assembly to eliminate any forces being imposed on the motor shaft. The forces on the table will be transferred to the swing arm, to the needle bearing stack up to the sheet metal bracket. Numerous issues with the prototype ready design came to light during our initial testing attempts. These issues include binding, unwanted rotation of the table about the Z axis, which can be referenced in the top right picture, and the inability to create orbital and double orbital patterns. The first problem was, that was tackled was the unwanted rotation of the table, which led to the introduction of 3D inserts to constrain the pin location in two of four slots. The introduction of slot inserts now meant that the stepper motor must complete full revolutions to achieve an orbital pattern. When this code alteration was tested, the system began to bind at maximum displacements due to a lack of slot width. The slots were then widened and corresponding inserts were added to the system seen in the bottom picture. These changes resulted in a system that does not bind, has no unwanted rotation, and is able to achieve an adjustable, an unadjustable orbital pattern. Lastly, the double orbital code was also altered to include full stepper motor rotations. This led to a large improvement on the functionality of the double orbital pattern, even though it was still inconsistent. You may notice that our slot inserts require additional components to fasten the slot in the pictures. This is not included in the final assembly and was a result of the rapid prototyping process that was used in search of a solution. Our user interface consists of four potentiometers and two push buttons paired with an I2C LCD. Looking at the left picture, four potentiometers are used to control the table pattern, RPM, size, and duration of time for the shaker table. There are also two push buttons that serve as the start button and software emergency stop button. While, the, while each output parameter is selected on the potentiometers, the designated parameters are updated on the I2C OCD screen as shown on the top right. Currently in that picture, the shaker table is set to double orbital pattern, 120 cycles per minute, orbital size of 20 millimeters, and a time duration of 15 minutes. Lastly, this user interface is tied into our main control perf board, which is essentially our motherboard. This board houses the Arduino, the two motor drivers, and the power outputs. The Arduino interprets the inputs and provides the appropriate system outputs in correspondence to the parameters selected in the user interface. 
The brains of the Arduino is controlled by designed code, which will be outlined in a later slide. The shaker table includes several different parameter options. There are three options for the pattern, which are linear, orbital, and double orbital. Three options for the motor RPM, which are 100, 150, and 200 RPM. There are three options for the linear pattern size of 15 millimeters, 20 millimeters, and 25 millimeters. And there are three options for the time duration, which are 15 minutes, 55 minutes, and two hours. Each of these values on the motor RPM, pattern size, or duration cases can be changed to meet customer needs as they may be updated throughout time. Up to six options can be comfortably used on any potentiometer. Each potentiometer uses the map function in Arduino that assigns an RPM. The potentiometer outputs an analog value from 0 to 1023 and is combined with the map function in Arduino to assign certain ranges of the analog output to desired values. The map function essentially breaks the potentiometer range into fractions, so using a maximum of six options yields a 60 degree range for each potentiometer. The high adjustability permits our shaker table to be customized as desired. Our design has self-calibrating capability that is implemented before every system start. Upon, upon machine startup, the machine automatically goes into calibration mode, which uses both stepper motors and two limit switches corresponding to each motor. Looking at the video on the left, the table begins in a random placement at the top left of the system. Motor one will then rotate clockwise until the limit switch has been hit. Similarly, motor two rotates clockwise until the limit switch is hit. After this, the table location is now identified and is programmed to move a predetermined number of steps equaling to 90 degrees in the counterclockwise direction. The table location is now centered and is ready for operation. During the calibration process, the LCD is simultaneously displaying updates. In the top right picture, it displays that the calibration of motor one is in progress and the LCD will hold this message until the process is done. In the bottom right picture, it shows that the calibration progress of motor one has been completed and will now move on to calibrate motor two. The respective displays will show for the motor two calibration. When the full calibration cycle is complete, the OCD screen will display the parameter options display. As mentioned before, the original prototype design was modified to have slot inserts for the functionality of the linear and orbital patterns. The picture on the left displays a linear and orbital configuration, which includes the use of slot inserts. The picture on the right represents the double orbital configuration, which does not use the slot inserts. The double orbital configuration does not use the slot inserts since the motors do not move in sync for this pattern. If the slot inserts were present, the motors would bind and result in the table not moving. Our shaker table was torture tested by running the design for long durations of time which, with each specified pattern. The linear pattern was tested for 55 minutes at 300 cycles per minute with a 15 millimeter range. After the testing, there was no noticeable damage to any of the components in the assembly and the design performance did not change in future testing. The challenges related to this testing include an inconsistency in amplitude, an excess in noise, and the base plate oscillating slightly. The orbital pattern was, was tested for two hours at 120 RPM with a 40 millimeter dimetrial range. After the testing, there was no noticeable damage to any of the components in the assembly and the design performance did not change in future testing. The challenges related to this testing include an excess in noise, the base plate oscillating slightly, occasional motor sync discrepancies, and a lower RPM than the maximum programmable speed that was required for the test. The double orbital pattern was tested at 55 minutes for 100 cycles per minute with a 40 millimeter dimetrial range. After the testing, there's no noticeable damage to any of the components in the assembly, and the design performance did not change in future testing. The challenges related to this testing include unwanted table rotation about the z-axis, inconsistent double orbital pattern, and a, low, and a lower RPM than the maximal programmable speed that was required for the test. As mentioned in prior slides, a few major challenges arose during prototyping. Changes were made to the design, which restored functionality, but compromised the performance of the original design. 
A few improvements were identified, which could potentially restore the original functionality while fixing the issues troubling the initial design. The main improvement we came up with was the addition of linkages, which allow each motor to rotate a pair of swing arms rather than just one. We quickly fabricated some linkages as seen in the image and rotated the motors by hand. And this appeared to eliminate most of the unwanted rotation of the table. The main hurdle preventing us from implementing and testing this design was time. Unfortunately, this idea was thought of late in the semester and its usage would have required a complete reworking of our code, which was not feasible in the time remaining time remaining we had. Another idea we had to increase performance is the addition of encoders on, on the motors to track motor rotation. At higher speeds, an issue developed where the stepper motors would become inconsistent and skip steps. Positional feedback from an encoder could help fix this issue. Our efforts at finding a solution to the rough motor operation was unsuccessful. We replaced the motor drivers various times and tried other NEMA 17 motors as well with no luck. For future iterations of the design, we would find a better combination to give smoother, faster, and more consistent operation. Another attempt at reducing noise and vibration could come from decreasing the tolerance between the slaws and bushings. Lastly, in the final design, we would like to introduce rubber barriers between any aluminum and steel interface to, to prevent galvanization of these materials. Our final assembly design has a high factor of simplicity incorporated from the beginning. It has a part count significantly lower than competing designs and has a total assembly time of only 481 seconds. This is approximately eight minutes and individual part assembly times were determined from the Boothroyd Dewhurst method. You can see on the slide that assembly times were determined from each sub assembly and then summed together for the total time. These steps were quantified individually based on the amount of time that the task difficulty provided. All steps taken during the assembly are simple and easily understood, allowing for non-mechanically gifted customers, such as business students, the ability to put this design together just as fast as capable engineering students. Additionally, all pieces of this design are easily interchangeable for future-proofing wear and tear among the future. This slide presents the cost of the prototype we made and the cost of this product for mass production. We have the costs broken down into electronics, machined and mechanical off the shelf parts. The price of the prototype that we made was $527.47. On, well, on mass production, the cost um, would be $271.94. A goal of our design was it for it to be simple and effective. This simplicity led to a low overall cost and to the use of mainly simple and thereby inexpensive parts. No single part on our PO was over $30. The price decrease from our prototype to mass production is a 48% reduction in price per unit. This price decrease is due um, to the choices of commonly and widely used parts, like common fasteners, electronic components, shafts, washers, and et cetera. We are proud of the cost of our shaker table and the parts. Thermal implications were considered for the safety of the electronic components of the assembly. Intermediate values associated with this analysis are housed in this slide including geometry, material thermal properties, energy consumption, as well as environmental assumptions. The Arduino Nano with a maximum operation temperature of 85 degrees Celsius is housed inside a polycarbonate plastic with a thermal conductivity described in this slide. The thermal circuit was done through the configuration on this slide with several assumptions being made for the purpose of assessing the temperature inside of the control box. Radiation was neglected due to the nature of the modeled system. The resistive values of the conduction and convection were then calculated through the usage of the surface area of the control box. Using previously defined power consumption values, the heat of the system was modeled as heat deriving as a function of the circuitry. The intermediate calculations were then used to create a function of control box temperature to elapse time. Further modeling describes a point of intersection where the heat of the control box ascends beyond the safe operating temperature of the Arduino Nano. The point of failure was found to occur at 1,092 minutes of continual and maxim maximum usage of the circuitry, equating to 18.2 hours or 0.75 days in the worst case scenario of operations. The plot, the plot associating time with temperature of the control box is shown on the right of the slide. Depending on future implications regarding ambient temperature of the bioreactor, additional resources to reduce the heat transfer into the control box may be necessary, 
as well as considerations of the heat, of the influx of heat produced specifically by the microcontrollers inside of the control box. Because of the design of our shaker table, each motor independently controlled the table position in either the X or Y axis. Motor one controlled X direction and motor two the Y. Each pattern was par uh, parameterized into an X or Y function in terms of T or time. This allowed for the position of the table and the X or Y axis to be calculated and controlled independently of each other. The parametrized functions are as shown. S is the desired orbital sign and omega is desired rotational speed. The linear functions are identical for X and Y. For orbital, the functions are identical. They run at the same orbital size and speed, but they run at a quarter of a cycle apart. For double orbital, motor, motor one runs at half the speed of motor two at a quarter of a cycle apart. The videos below model the parametrized functions. To move the motors to achieve the desired table movement, the following code was implemented. The code relied on the Arduino internal time keeping function millis. At time one and time two, we're recorded each loop. Time one corresponds to the time of the previous loop and time two corresponds to the sequential loop. Correspondingly, X1 and X2 were calculated using the parametrized equations. X1 being the current X position of the table at the previous loop and X2 being the desired X position of the table for the next loop. X1 and X2 were then used to calculate theta one and theta two, which correspond to the angle of the swing arm with respect to the X axis of the motor. The difference between theta one and theta two was used to calculate the steps the motor needed to take to move the table to the, to the desired position. This process is the same for the Y position. This was the original code that was used to create adjustable lin linear orbital and double orbital motion. Unfortunately, due to the capabilities of our motor, motor drivers, and the rotation of the table, the fully adjustable patterns were never realized. The code demanded precision and ability that our motors and motor drivers could not reach, as our motors were jumpy and inconsistent. The resolution of our motor and motor drivers limited the accuracy of the motor stepping, as the number of steps the motor needed to move had to be rounded each loop. This rounding error propagated and also contributed to the inaccuracy. As stated previously, the table was also not rotationally fixed, and as it would rotate, it would increasingly stray from the desired position and eventually bind and stall. While fully adjustable patterns were not achieved, an adjustable linear pattern was, by only utilizing one motor with the code from the previous slide. Orbital and double orbital patterns were achieved. However, they were not adjustable. The size of the pattern was determined by the length of the swing arm. To achieve orbital motion, each motor was controlled to rotate at the same speed, a quarter of a cycle apart. For double orbital, one motor moved at a regular speed, the other at half that speed, the motors at a quarter of a cycle apart. While fully adjustable patterns were not realized this semester, we believe they can be achieved with better motors and motor drivers, such as micro stepper motor drivers, and a higher voltage being supplied to the motors. In conclusion, the Unicus Exitar shaker table designed by Quatil is a cost-effective, small-scale, and operational shaker table. The overall dimensions were designed to be 12.8 by 12.8 by 3.85 inches to correlate with the small-scale operations. The system had a displacement res resolution of 0.63 millimeters in the X and Y axes, while it operated continuously for two hours straight with no complications and endured over seven total hours of testing. This design gives a fresh addition to the shaker table market with its unique single plane of motion and the design to simplify the ease of manufacturing, assembly, and user interaction. Additionally, the cost of the system is maintained at low rates through the off-the-shelf mechanical and electrical components chosen, as well as the simplistically designed parts. We would like to extend our, grat our gratitude to the guests of the presentation for their time in viewing our design. Furthermore, we would like to thank our corporate sponsors for their continued support in our professional development. We now open the floor for any questions regarding Quatia's Unicus Exitar. All right, it's time for questions from the panel. Um, Professor Stein, if, if you've got a minute or two uh, and have any questions, I know you got to run, but this would be a good time to ask. Oh, I think you've got your mute engaged. Uh-oh. Uh, Professor Stein, we can't hear you. Uh, 
I was about ready to drop off and I had already muted and I apologize. I just said, I'm, I'm already running late for the function I need to leave to. Overall, it was good. I do have questions. I will email you and uh, I'll make sure uh, Hunter sends me a complete copy of the presentation before I do that. Excellent. Okay. Thank you for your attendance. Uh, we don't want to hold you any further. So, Thank you, Ron. Okay. Who's next? Can I go next? Yes. Hi guys. Sorry. Sorry. I was late. I had another meeting that ran over. Um, so I did miss the first like 10 minutes or so. Although I'm sure that probably made you happy that I wasn't there. You were like, Oh, thank God. He's, he's not in this presentation. Um, I, I don't have, I, I've got to, I've got to, can you go back to the, the, uh, the cost slide for me? I guess first of all, I also need to say, way to go guys. You were like the one group who didn't use any linear rails and you took the the offhand comment by Dr. Trom uh, to heart and actually made something that is different from every, like completely unique. I think there's only one or two other devices that have any amount of uniqueness and you guys are by far, you are unique for a completely different reason and it's awesome. Um, You're also the only group that I have seen that has their OTS parts and their manufactured parts being close to on par with one another. Everybody else was 80% OTS, 20% manufactured. And you're, I don't know, it's about a third, which is, you know, pretty good compared to everyone else. And I guess I'm going to go with the, uh, the 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 question here being, I've been asking it to everybody. Those mechanical OTS parts, if you could manufacture, are there any of those that you think could be switched over to manu manufactured or machined parts to drop your cost further? Like where you could drop OTS cost and get it over into machined cost, and it would be cheaper to manufacture the part in house than it would be to purchase it OTS. Um, there's a couple of instances where we're buying stuff like shafts and ended up like, we're, we're basically, and it happened this semester, like we bought a bunch of shafts at the smallest quantity that McMaster sold when really we only needed like an inch total. So for the point of prototyping, you know, we couldn't do anything, but if it actually came to batch production, it, I would imagine it would be cheaper to make that stuff in house or outsource it to a manufacturing plant, just so we're not paying for things that we don't need. Um, I would say it's mostly related to the shafts because uh, most of our OTS stuff is related to just fasteners, uh, screws, bolts, stuff like that. Um, when you did your when you did your costing for like fasteners, bolts, stuff like that, did you do the cost of the package of fasteners, or did you do the cost per fastener? For the prototyping, we did cost of the package. And then for batch, we did the cost per fastener. Okay. Cool. Yep. Cool, cool. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm just gonna say again, like great job, guys. Like I love that you did something this far outside of the box. And I especially love that you got it working. Cause Thank I know you. there we was appreciate it. there was a period of time where that was in question and Great job getting it, getting it to work and doing something very different from everyone else. I love yeah, it. We appreciate your your help and guidance to that as well. That's very helpful. We do. Thank you. I just look angry and yell at pieces of aluminum until they do what I'm telling them to do. I'll keep that in mind. Yeah, I just kind of want to echo Nimi's point here. You know, it's this is such a unique class because they're at least as far as like the grading of it goes right there's no right or wrong answer that necessarily will give you um a, a definite grade right and so of course you guys definitely struggled in the actual um testing phase due to a lot of unforeseen errors um and the reality of the situation is if you were to do this project again uh, but not in the class setting in the like real world industry. Like if you guys came together and we're going to say, okay, not related to a class, we're going to make a shaker table that we could sell on the market. And you ran into this problem. 
you know, all of a sudden it's like, okay, now you got to completely redesign, go back, look at what happened. Uh, and so this is a very real thing that can happen um, in, in that industry. And in fact, happens quite a lot. Um, and so I, I just want to say again that um, I think you guys did an absolutely fantastic job for all of the unforeseen errors that this project ran into. Um, and I think it really reflects in the amount of uh, hard work that you did to try to get the thing to work. So I just want to say that I really appreciate uh, all of the effort put in. So good job this semester, guys. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. All right, go to your heat transfer analysis. Oh boy, here we go. Next, next slide. What's wrong with this? I'm not sure. Uh oh. Okay. <clears throat> um, it's a straight line, right? Your yeah. te temperature is increasing as a function of time. And yeah, okay, that, that temperature increase is very, oh, Dr. Nimi's crying. <laughs> <laughs> temperature increase is very slow with respect to time, but it's, it's a straight line. Um, does your heat transfer not take into consideration the fact that as the temperature of your box increases, the rate of heat transfer away from the box? also increases. And so you should reach an asymptotic steady state temperature for long periods of time. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. Whenever I was um, doing the code for this, I was thinking about why it was linear specifically. And I was trying to kind of work around because I realized it, it shouldn't be linear. Um, but I think inside of the confines of, um, I guess, specifically, like I kind of had to work from using an assumption that the primary means of heat uh, came from the circuitry. I kind of just worked around that to kind of come to this conclusion because and that's kind of like why I said um, future implications with the ambient temperature kind of relating to that. So it's kind of just trying to work with the confines I had. Mm, okay, uh, can we go back one slide? Natural convection coefficient 10 watts per meter squared Kelvin, where did that come from? Uh, I got it online. I'd have to resource the exact uh, link, but. Is that <clears throat> forced convection, natural convection? I believe, I believe that's forced. Okay, uh, and that's the forced convection coefficient off the sides of the box, top of the box? I believe, I mean, I, I, I'm gonna be honest, I didn't put that into consideration. Okay, yeah, so, so that, that number is also suspect. Um, uh, yeah, 10 is, that, is. That's error. It's like, error is like one to 10, I thought. It, uh, it, it, so if you look at a heat transfer textbook on like, you know, like page two of the heat transfer textbook, they give a range for natural convection and air. And it's usually somewhere between like one and 10. But it, when you actually calculate it, unless you're in some, like really extreme situations where something is like so hot that it's glowing red, um, that that value is more like five. Um, so anyway yeah so so you know you if, if you went to you know the internet and looked it up the internet will tell you 10 but but practical experience um the number is, is lower than that uh, by by a bit um my other question since we're, we're here which is not a heat transfer question although we'll get back to heat transfer in a second um is why is your pcb so big like you've got these tiny little components and then you've got this big chip um, we have a lot connecting to that board because we have our other, like LCD, that the whole back of the board is full um, of solder. And I, we did that so that we didn't have to jump wires. Um, so there's no jumps across solders to make sure that is actually like true and nothing is interconnected. Um, we have a couple power terminals. I, I, I guess I can't tell you exactly why it looks like we don't have a lot, but if you turn the board around, it's full. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. 
um, so then that was a different question. So, so back to heat transfer. So you guys have got this circuit here. Um, what is happening here? Can, can you guys explain? I think later on you said that, that you've neglected radiation, um, but you've got a convective resistor, a conductive resistor, and another convective resistor. So, so what, what are those resistances representing? So the logic, I kind of went through it and I resourced um, some papers online kind of looking at this through it. I was kind of thinking um, specifically the convection started with the outside temperature. So say the, the shaker table is housed inside the bioreactor. So the ambient temperature and, and that would be considered the first temperature of the surroundings. Obviously, that would have to go through the resistance of the convec convective resistance of that air. Then it would go through kind of like the walls, which we use those parameters on the left side. Um, for the conduction resistance. And then I kind of wanted to add another convective um, resistance as far as inside of the box. Uh, that might be double, double counting it, but I figured it's it's in a way kind of um, in series um, when it relates to the actual contact with the Arduino Nano. Okay, so, so we've got two, two of these. And then later on, you said that you neglected radiation, right? Which yeah. um, I, I think is is the one element of this that I agree with. Um, so, um, so you've got two convective heat transfer resistances um, and, and then you've got this number 10, which I already suggested is probably suspect. Um, which one of those convective resistances corresponds to 10? Uh, the outside one. Okay, and how did you calculate the inside one? I'm gonna be honest, I used 10 for both, to be honest, yeah. yeah. Are they, both the same phenomenon? I just kind of made the analysis as simplistic as possible. Um, so I use the same coefficient for both. Hmm. Is that right? I guess let me let me ask a different so so what's what's the difference between like why why am I asking this question? What's what's the difference between the <laughs> internal resistance, which is convective, and the external resistance, which is convective. They're both convective, that's true. But what makes them different? I guess as far as I'm thinking, the outside air is not inherently confined to like the volume ah. of the control box. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, that's it. So you're going to end up with, um, I don't know, in heat transfer, if you talked about Rayleigh number, if you did um, convective heat transfer, natural convective heat transfer, you, you should have, but you know, <laughs> what you should have done and what actually happens in heat transfer, two, sometimes two different things. Uh, but yeah, you, you've got it dead on. So, so that number 10, which I think is already high, um, is gonna be even lower um, inside the box than outside of the box because you've got that, that kind of ceiling that's confining it. So you're gonna end up with maybe, maybe possibly, a natural convection coefficient in there uh, where the hot air rises, touches the roof, cools down, and then sinks again, right? So you might get that circulation pattern. But then again, you might not. Um, and if not, then it's not convective heat transfer anymore. It's then just straight conduction through, um, through the air. Um, the other thing that is, and this is the last thing I'll say about heat transfer, and then I'll, I'll stop beating you guys up about this. Um, it, where's the path for heat transfer through the bottom of the box? Like from the chip through the bottom of the box into the table. I don't see that in the circuit. Yeah, that's a good point. That one might actually be your, your highest, uh, well, I was gonna say your lowest resistance, your, your highest conductance uh, might be through um, basically contact resistance to the table. So um, now, Okay, I said I wasn't going to ask any more questions, but I'm going to ask one more. Um, when you guys actually ran this experiment, did it behave? Oh, my email is telling me it's time to stop. Did um, did it actually behave the way that it was supposed to? Like, did you guys see it? Because that your 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 warm up curve uh, curve in air quotes because it was a straight line that you showed me in the next slide was yeah it was like really slow and long right like we're talking like days um was that 
consistent with what actually happened? Because I, I think I heard you guys say that the motors couldn't actually keep up with the the rotation rates that you were demanding of them. Um, so doesn't that mean that your motor drivers were like burning out as you were trying to drive the motors so fast? So yeah, that's man. That's we didn't get to actually like use the the oven um, to do the torture testing as far as that goes. But that's why I specifically talked about how a big uh, thing we would like to look into the future is the microcontrollers because whenever we did um, the endurance testing, we did notice that specifically the microcontrollers and the heat sinks were heating up to um, pretty large values. So that would definitely be something we'd have to consider in the future. Yeah, we're probably way above 85. So that's probably why they were burning out, right? So, so ultimately, this uh, something like 1,000 minutes to reach the burnout temperature that you predicted in your model was not what you experienced in real life. You, you burned out quite a bit faster. Yeah, OK. Um, Oh, well, I had one more question, but now I, I've, I've lost it because I'm so excited by heat transfer. So um, let me let me let me stop there for a second. This ne next question will come to me, but um, I'm sure there are mechanical questions that other people want to ask. Quick, guys, get off of the heat transfer slide so Dr. Trump forgets about more heat transfer questions. There we I go. I know in the past, um, spillage was something that was discussed when talking about the shaking system. Was that um, considered for this with like specifically well plates or is that just like assume that there's some way to keep the liquid contained inside of a, whatever it's stored in? Um, yeah, spillage, we, the testing that we did with, um, you know, fluids were actually using the well plate um, and test or not well plate the test tube rack. As far as spillage goes, um, I think that the kind of inherent vibrations in our system that you can see in some of the in some of the gifts we have would contribute to spillage. Um, but if we were able to tune down that vibration through um, like the tighter tolerances between the bushings and the slots, like we mentioned, and get smoother motors. I think that the spillage could be confined just by tuning the RPM. Um, I don't think there's any reason for you know our shaker table to you know cause more spills than anyone else if we can get it running smoothly. It's just I think it should be a function of RPM and orbital size, which would be defined by the bio people. Okay. What type of um, tolerances are you looking at in those um, slots that you have for the um, the motor arms? Because I imagine that'd be pretty tight. Because if they're too big, you're it's not going to rotate. If it's too tight of um, tolerance, then it's going to be really stiff, right? Correct. It's about um, it's about ten thou right now, or at least it should be. But in our manufacturing, we didn't have the proper bit to widen the slots. So we just kind of, you know, eyeballed it to the best we could at the time. So the actual prototype Classic does not have, yeah, the, the, the actual prototype does not have that tolerance. And we were unable to really get a feel for it um, at the time. One thing that did, um, that we, we forgot to mention, but initially we had plastic bushings that were supposedly like rated for the application according to the website we got them from. But after our first round of torture testing, like we saw that they were physically deteriorating. So we changed the plastic ones, which definitely performed better, but obviously they're just decaying super fast. So we replaced them with um, bronze impregnated oil bushings or oil impregnated bronze. Sorry, got that backwards. Um, and that made it that the vibrations I think got worse there because the bronze was harder than the plastic but we lost the, the deterioration, so. Did you do any calculations for that about like how strong that material actually needs to be to not deteriorate or how long it can be expected to last? Um, I did do calculations on the bushing life for the, or actually, I don't think I actually reached a specific uh, value for the life 
but I did do like the max PV calculations for the bushing and we had a factor of safety greater than 1.5, which was the customer need required for it. Okay. But yeah, I don't have a number for the life, sorry. Yeah, it's, it's fine. I remember my question, but I also want to give other people a chance to ask questions. Well, let, let Alex ask his. Yeah, Alex. Be all end all question. Ask, ask your question, because actually th that your question is very relevant to this team too. It, it is it is very relevant. Uh, however, I think um, the answer is is going to not surprise um, anyone. No, there's uh, there's but, a there's so, a right answer here. Okay. Okay. Um, so so this is a question that, that has been uh, posed to all groups, and this is not a trick question. This is a, a genuine question that's meant to gauge your assessment of uh, the semester and your design. But after going through the design process, the prototyping process, and actually seeing this thing manifest itself in real life, and then looking around the room at some of the other designs that your fellow students designed, if you were to do this project again, do you believe that this style of mechanical interface of a design is on the right track to be the most optimal design to accomplish all of the customer needs in the most optimal way? Or if you were to do this again, if you would switch uh, actual mechanisms and go to a completely different design? And if so, which one do you think has the most optimal way of meeting all of the customer needs? Um, I think like the quote unquote obvious slash easy route would just be to scrap it and go to linear rails because you know, looking around the room, I've seen, you know, 90% of the groups with linear rails like, and their project can do things that we can just by nature. And I think that the linkage idea that we had, if we were able to test that, I might answer it a little bit differently. And if we were able to get some of the vibration out of the system and make it quiet, because uh, thankfully um, noise is not a customer need because we were just ridiculously loud. So if it was a customer need, I'm sure the customer would not be happy. But um, I think there's definitely room for improvement in the design. I think we outlined that well. Um, and I think after those you know, tests or, um, have been implemented, maybe we would choose to stick with this design. But me personally, I would just go back to linear rails and just, you know, I would, I would probably use everyone's everyone's attempt with the linear rails this semester and see what I can identify if it's bad somewhere and try and fix it from there. Yeah, I'd also like to add, um, I think that if we had like another semester to work on this project, I think that would really like, like I think that would really help us have like a, a clear idea of whether this, this idea was um, like, was like um, if it has the potential to be proficient enough. Um, I think like, uh, the, you know, the process of this of this semester as we were look, looking through it and you know really kind of met some difficulties and try to overcome them um i think if we had like just like more time and like another semester to like you know tackle like these the difficulties we have specifically rotation of the table um and then also like some of the uh, the, the motor issue in terms of just like better motors and, and motor drivers um i think like i would really like to see how it would work with those things um and i think like that would give us a, a better idea of whether this was um, like a, a good, like a, a design that was proficient enough to meet the customer needs. Um, so I think like, so right now, like, I, I, I don't know if I would, if we would say with confidence that this is like, um, probably the best design out there. Um, like it probably is not, um, compared to like what we've seen in other classes, uh, in, in other groups, um, that have like really great designs. Um, I think it, you know, uh, I think there are, there are designs with the linear rails that, um, are really successful. And I, I think that like really where we like are, 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 niche is 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 with cost that um we have like just you know our, our system is a lot more simple and less complex um so i think like if if we had more time to figure out um a, a good way to um develop this product to really uh, meet all the customer needs um i think it, I, I i i think we'd be able to stand on it and confidently say that this is a really good design um but i think like as of right now like i i don't think um we have enough you know evidence based off of our product to, to confidently be, uh, be behind it so that's just, I think, what, what I would say like, about that question.
All right, um, any other questions from Alexander, Alex, Dr. Nimi? I'm good. Okay. I've actually got to get going, so. Yeah, we, well. You yeah. need to also, you got another presentation after this. At 4.05 and I'm realizing that they're actually in the wrong room, so I've got to go rescue them because they're in the, 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 the lecture Zoom meeting instead of the, their own Zoom meeting that they created. I don't quite know how that happened, but no. I'll track track them down anyway so so okay i won't i won't uh i won't demand a, a, an answer to my heat transfer question but the question was going to be um at least from from my perspective um the, the big killer was was heat transfer right you guys talked about like you know better motor drivers and things burning out and stuff but it's i think if you had solved the heat transfer problem maybe those things would not have happened uh, at least to the extent that they seem to to kind of inundate your progress. So um, no need to answer this because there's no time left. But what I was going to ask um, is you know, how would you have fixed the heat transfer problem um, given that you've got everything like contained in a closed box, but um, maybe you guys could send me an email or something afterwards with the answer to that question. That's what I was going to ask. Um, my kind of final parting thought here um, is in, in my mind, and I, I think Dr. Nimi and I maybe disagree on this, but in my mind, the the whole point of this class is um you have a safety net right if you're if you're out in the real world um and your boss says you know design some cool thing your immediate reaction is i'm going to go and design something incredibly safe and not creative so that i get to keep my job because if you design some crazy thing that doesn't work your company goes out of business and you get fired and you're homeless um in mech three there, there's a safety net which is if you design something that's innovative and creative and it doesn't work we we don't fire you in fact we don't even give you a bad grade we we praise you because we're so excited that you you did something innovative so um so i, I just want to throw that out there that that um i think dr nimi said it and alex said it but i'll reiterate it that um being the only group that didn't have rails in your design i think had several benefits some related to the product and some related to your learning um the one benefit related to the product itself is that your cost is lower and competitive against all the other costs we've seen by about two hundred dollars which is like the cost of the rails right so you guys are able to if, if this did get to, to a point where it worked um you'd be able to undercut all your competitors and corner the market. So um, I think that's that's beneficial. But then also, I think you guys learned a bunch about like troubleshooting and um, you know heat transfer and tolerances and going back to the drawing board and fixing things. Um, so you know, okay, maybe this iteration was not you know wildly successful, but you guys have got war stories now to tell potential employers that other students in the class don't don't have right there's there's benefit from failing right at least in in the context of a, of a capstone course so um you know i think you guys handled it with with um you know maturity and poise and grit and persistence uh and you you didn't give up even though initially things looked dire so um i just wanted to you know add my my voice to the chorus of, of Dr. Nimi and Alex to, to just thank you guys for, for approaching this project in a different way than everybody else did and sort of rolling with the punches as things did not go quite as we expected them. Uh, but you know, you reached a, a conclusion where you've got videos that show this shaker table shaking, right? So it's um, I think a, a, ultimately a, a pedagogical success story if, if maybe not a product success story. So thank you for that. And even better, it 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 shook and it didn't it didn't twist while it rotated it it went where you told it to go like it did what you it did what it did what you wanted it to do which is yeah awesome great work guys congratulations i i do agree with trauma like mech 3 is a safety net you can do something crazy and have it break and not work and we're not going to fail you for it we'll we'll praise you for it at the end of the day as long as you learn from the failures and you guys certainly learn from your early failures and powered through and did something awesome. So way to go, congratulations. Way to kick some ass. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you yeah, for coming. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and now, now I really gotta go. So I'm gonna hit the record stop button.